Welcome to Small Arms Solutions. Today we're looking at a rather interesting rifle. We, we definitely have to thank one of our viewers for loaning it uh, to us. Uh, this is a Dragunov Tiger Hunter Carbine, which is basically a hunter version of the SVD Dragunov. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the SVD Dragunov. Uh, basically find out where this rifle came from, uh, and also how it is compared to its, uh, its military issue brother. Now this is the design of a gentleman named Yagevny Dragunov. Uh, there was a competition that was held. In fact, uh, Simonov and some of the other very well-known uh, Russian small arms designers were involved with it. And it was designed to be a squad support weapon. Basically, something that would be able to engage targets beyond the range of the, of the average AK-47. It was supposedly a, a sniper or designated marksmanship rifle. Now, I want to use these terms a little bit loosely because when you compare the accuracy of a Soviet Dragunov compared to, say, an M110 or one of the modern rifles, these things are night and day. The first opportunity I had to really fire a Dragunov, I was in the Ukraine uh, about four or five years ago. Uh, we were at one of their training ranges, um, and we had uh, several of the standard SVD uh, Dragunovs. Uh, and uh, we were shooting it probably, oh, I would say we had targets from 100 yards out to 500 yards. And I have to say... Uh, Coming from somebody who's used to using an M110 type rifle or SR25 or an LMT308, I was shocked uh, at the difference in accuracy. When you look at the M110 or the LMT or anything along the you know, modern NATO lines as a precision type sniper rifle, and the Dragonaut really is not. It certainly fires a long range cartridge, the 7.62 by 54R cartridge, as we see right here. Uh, this happens to be the oldest military caliber still in existence today. Uh, this was started to be used around 1891, if I recall, in the Mosin Nagant. And the Russians have kept it ever since. Uh, it, it has evolved from a standard bolt action round of the Mosin Nagant. It was adapted to the PKM general purpose machine gun. It was adapted to the Dragunov uh, and, you know, and other weapons uh, throughout the, the history of the Soviet Union as well, or Russia. Uh, it's very, very effective. It's about equal to the American 30-06 in power. Now, the difficulty with the 762x54R, the R stands for rimmed, which means the base, you have a rimmed cartridge case, like a 3030 Winchester, as opposed to a rimless, like you have on the 7.92 Mauser or any of the American cartridges. And what that difficulty is, is if that's not placed in a magazine properly, you have what's called rim lock. What rim lock is, is what that rim lo locks onto the rim of the cartridge beneath it. So when the bolt goes to go forward, it pulls out two cartridge cases instead of one which basically means that with your magazine, you have to make sure that when you load the magazine, that each rim is in front of the one behind it. So that way you don't have the issue with the rim lock going off. And also when uh, Mikhail Kalashnikov went to work on his PKM general purpose machine gun, it was not easy making a mechanism that would work with the rim cartridge case either. But the Soviets did not ever want to change calibers. They, they, were, they, they liked what they had, and they basically made everything they had around it. Uh, that was until the adoption of the 762 by 39 as we see here, for the AK-47 RPD, which is eventually replaced by the 545. However, even though the 762 by 39 is no longer in service with the Soviet Union or Russia uh, now, you still have the 762 by 54R, and you still have the SVD Dragunov. The Dragunov SVD, uh, SVD basically stands for Sniper System of Dragunov, model 1963. I'm not even going to attempt to say it in Russian. I don't speak Russian. Now, when the rifle was first developed... It uh, resembled that of an AK. It had the same manual of arms as, a, as an AK for as far as having the way the bolt mechanism worked and the safety. However, the gun is totally different from a Kalashnikov in the way that it operates. Uh, basically, having the safety location and the bolt, that's about the only thing that's about it's the same. Instead of having a long stroke piston system as, uh, as you do on an AK, you have a short stroke piston on here. You have a cold hammer forged barrel. Now, the barrel on the Dragunov was 24 inches uh, in length. Now, one of the interesting things was, was the rifling that it had. As the rifle was developed, it was developed to fire the lighter 140 grain projectile, which was around, which was a rifling twist of 1 in 12.6 inches. Well, in the late 70s, it was changed to 1.9, 1 in turn in 9.4 inches. And the reason for that was they wanted it to fire more of the heavy ball ammunition. The heavy, heavy ball ammunition, which would include uh, ball, tracer, armor piercing, armor piercing, incendiary, so the rifle could also be used for any type of material. Now, the one issue that came up with that was when they, when they boosted that up, they also lost uh, accuracy. Now, according to the Soviets, uh, they lost about 13% of its accuracy potential by switching rifling twists and switching to ammunition. Uh, the more accurate ammunition that I've found is going to be more towards the lighter 140, 148 grain projectiles. Now, just a little bit more on the ammunition. Uh, as we can see where we've gone over the last uh, century or so, 
starting in, over here, you're going to see that we have the American 30 at six. We went down to the seven, which was 7.62 by 63. Then we went down to the 7.62 by 51, which was supposed to be our intermediate cartridge, but wasn't, but that's another story. That was replaced by the 5.56 by 45 millimeter. We go back to World War II, the, the main German battle cartridge was the larger 7.92 by 57 millimeter Mauser. And we also went down to the 7.92 by 33 Kurs of the Sturmgewehr. We also have a very similar pattern that the Soviet Union had gone to from the 7.62 by 54R to 7.62 by 39 to 5.45. These were originally a battle. The battle rifles were the Mosin Nagant's chamber in this. When they switched over to the AK 47s, they went to the intermediate cartridge, and then they went towards the, uh, the small caliber high velocity uh, in 1974. However, this maintained the general purpose machine gun round. Just like in the United States, the 7.62 by 51 has remained the General, general purpose cartridge as well. Most long range rifles are using this as well. Now, the, the Dragunov has been, uh, you know, it's a definitely a fairly reliable weapon. Now, I think a lot of the issues that come with it is the type of barrel that it has and also the ammunition. The Soviets have really put out what you would call match grade ammunition. They utilize a steel cartridge case. Most of the, the bullets are bi metal um, and they also have steel penetrator cores in them. It's uh, Those things just don't produce what you would call match grade loads. Especially when you consider armor piercing cores, if those cores aren't put in there properly, it can throw the balance of the cart and the bullet off and it can cause it to have flyers that can affect accuracy as well. So I think certainly one of the issues that the rifle has uh, versus many of the NATO counterparts is uh, the precision ammunition that's used. And also the fact that you have a heavy piston that's uh, drilled and pinned to the barrel like so it does affect barrel harmonics. So I think it's a combination of the barrel twist, the ammunition, uh, as well as the way the gas system is clamped on. Those are all uh, factors that go into the accuracy of this rifle not being up to par with NATO. Also the trigger. The trigger on this rifle is rather spongy. Uh, it's not what you would call a match grade trigger by no means. It is not the same trigger mechanism as that of an AK either. As I said, this may look like an AK somewhat, but when we start getting into this thing and taking it apart, you're going to see that it's not like an AK at all. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go over a little bit about what this rifle is particularly. Now this rifle is the Tiger Carbine. The Tiger Carbine goes to a shorter barrel. From the original Dragunov, you have a 24-inch barrel. This goes down to a 20-inch barrel. And looking at the muzzle, you'll see that we do not have any muzzle device on here at all. Where the Dragunov, the military SVD-63, will have a flash suppressor on here. Also, you'll notice that the front sight is exposed rather than having the protective ears of that of the Dragunov as well. So now if we start going back, you'll see the handguard. You have a black polymer handguard. Now, this rifle also comes with a uh, wooden handguard as well. Uh, this particular one has the, the black handguard on. The rear sight. Now, the military SVD, you're looking at uh, adjustment up to 1,000 yards, where this one here is only adjustable up to 300 yards. Again, this rifle is designed as a hunting carbine, not a sniper rifle. We go to the rear, uh, basically from the from the back to, down to here, this is the exact same thing as the Dragunov SVD. The magazine that this one comes with is a 5-round magazine as opposed to the 10-round magazines of the SVD Dragunov. We go back to the rear here, we'll see the stock assembly. This is the wooden stock assembly. There is also a polymer stock. Now the SVD comes with a adjustable cheek piece that comes on, on here to help elevate your, your, your face to get you in line with the optic on here. Uh, this happens to be the wood one. You'll see that there's also a, a rubber butt pad on here as well. So this is unique to the Hunter Carbine as well. It's a far less expensive rifle to produce. Its requirements for accuracy are not nearly the same for the, for a shorter range hunting hunting rifle. And we definitely saw that when we, we did the test firing with it uh, for as far as its accuracy is compared to the uh, standard Dragunov. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about accuracy here before I get into the uh, disassembly. Now, we fired a few different kinds of ammunition out of here, and it was less than impressive because what I'm used to with the uh, 3 0 weights or 7.62 data rifles, we're looking at minute of angle to 2 minute of angle at maximum. Now, the two types of ammunition that we used on this rifle, one was the PPU, Privy Partisan, and that was a 182 grain full metal jacket. Uh, we had an average of 2,536 feet per second out of that ammunition, and the next one we had was the Wolf 762 by 54 r 148 grain bi-metal full metal jacket with an average velocity of 2,667 feet per second. Now, one of the things that I'm certainly interested to know myself is the effect of bimetal projectiles on rifling. Uh, bimetal basically means you have a combination of steel and copper, where the, the PPU ammunition, for instance, is a standard copper gilding jacket. The ammunition that we test fired in here for accuracy uh, from Wolf was a bimetal. So you think uh, you have a steel jacket on a steel barrel that may increase the wear on the barrel. Now, the best groups that we got was at 100 yards cold, uh, which is 2.3 inches, and that was with a PPU ammunition. 
And the interesting thing, once the barrel heated up, say a magazine or so, uh, after that, we opened up to about 3.1 inches at 100 yards with a warm barrel. So match grade accuracy, no. Uh, the average M110, you will be, you know, sub MOA, sub under, under one MOA at 100 yards. So you're looking at the average of 2.3 inches with this one with the good ammunition, the good copper plated, copper jacketed ammunition. And then, you know, with just the barrel heating up 3.1, we experienced a similar issue with the uh, M14. Uh, it shot very, very well on a cold bore, but once you went through a couple magazines and barrel heated up, you started getting a shift uh, to the left, and you also started seeing a lot more of a dispersion. So some of these guns shoot very, very well with a cold barrel, but once you start heating up, they, there becomes an issue. So the overall accuracy with these is not really what you would call impressive. However, is it going to engage a, a silhouette target or human target out at two, three hundred yards? Yes, it will. Uh, it's definitely not going to put the bullets into the, you know, into a precision spot, but this was not designed as a precision rifle as much as it was more of a DMR type rifle. It does what it was designed to do. No more, no less. Exactly what it was designed to do. So this particular rifle, these came into the United States, uh, from 1993 to 1994. Uh, there was unfortunately an importation ban that was put in, in place in 1994, which has really caused the prices of these to go up. Incredibly, this rifle here probably now goes for around five thousand dollars, if not if that a little bit more. It's made by the Izmash Company in the Chef's Russia. Uh, this was the Kalashnikov barrel, uh, where Mikhail Kalashnikov, his design barrel was. And we'll see more when we take it apart. But uh, one of the things that separates this from an AK again is the bolt. Uh, the bolt on an AK-47 or AKM has two locking lugs, where this one will have three. Short, short piston. As I said, the barrel length is twenty point eight inches. Uh, the rifling is a four R with a one turn and nine point five inches. And this is designed so it will fire the heavy ball, heavy ball animation as well as the lighter, which again is what, uh, according to the Soviets, they claim that you're looking at uh, you know, a loss of 19% of the potential of accuracy. Um, this weighs 8.6 pounds with no magazine, comes with a two five-round magazines. The stock it comes with is a wooden thumb hole stock, as you see on it, uh, with a rubber butt pad, but it also comes with a black polymer handgun. Now I want to do a little bit of a comparison between this and the SVD with some of the, uh, the stats on it. Uh, for as far as the barrel length on the, on the military SVD, 24 inches. The Tiger is 20 inches. Rear sights, 1,200 meters on the SVD, 300 meters on the Tiger. Adjustable gas block, yes on the SVD, no on the Tiger. Thumbhole stock, again on the SVD you have a uh, thumbhole stock without a rubber butt pad and you have the adjustable cheek piece. This one is, it comes as you see right here. Flash hider on the SVD, not on the Tiger. Front sight is hooded post on the SVD. There's just the blades you see on this one. And there's a bayonet lug on the SVD where there is not on this one. As you can see from the stats, there's quite a bit of a difference between this and the SVD. And the accuracy issues that, you know, that I see, again, coming from the West where we're used to seeing uh, you know, precision rifles under one MOA. I had an opportunity uh, when I was in the Ukraine uh, about a year or two ago to be able to sit down with one of the sniper instructors. Uh, this particular sniper instructor, we only knew him as bad. Uh, we weren't given his, his, uh, his full name because the Russians have a price out on his head because he trains all the Ukrainian snipers that cause uh, Russians a headache in the, in the Crimea. Uh, this particular gentleman was an Afghan war vet uh, with the Soviet army. And, of course, when the Soviet Union fell, uh, this gentleman was Ukrainian. He went to uh, the military of the Ukraine and trained people there. So I wanted to ask him what uh, his experience with the Dragunovs were. You know, so what, you know, I asked him, what is your average groups that you get out of Dragunovs? Uh, and he basically told me that, uh, well, uh, some of the best ones will shoot .78, and it'll go right out to uh, almost four inches at 100 yards. Uh, that's the guns that they see there and that they use every day. So, uh, unfortunately for the Ukrainians, the weapons that they have are all old Soviet weapons. Um, they never got resupplied, obviously, after the Soviet Union uh, collapsed, um, especially with uh, them wanting to be members of NATO. But uh, this gentleman here, uh, Mr. Bad, if you would, um, had a lot of experience uh, with these guns throughout the, throughout the years, you know, going, from, going back to Afghanistan. That was really the first time that the Dragunov really... Uh, saw use was in, was in the Afghanistan time period. You know, it was adopted in 1963. These were seen in the Vietnam War. Uh, they were seen in several other places. The Dragunov has been manufactured in other countries, uh, just, as, just as much so as the uh, AKs have. However, not as many. There are countries who have developed their own versions of these, such as the, the uh, Romanians with their PSL, which is a similar concept, but they were not given that data, but was used by many of the different countries. I think what we're going to do now is we're going to take this thing apart and we're going to show you some of the differences between this and, this and the regular AK. So what we're going to do is we're going to disassemble. Uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to remove the magazine. We're going to push forward. Drop out the magazine. Ensure that we're, we're empty. 
So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to remove the top cover by pushing downward on this lever. Lifting up and pulling back. And as you can see, the recoil spring, this is all attached to the top cover. Then we're going to pull the bolt back, lift right out. Now, as you can see, there's no operating rod because instead of this being a long stroke like the AK, this is a short stroke. And we have the bolt here as well. And you can see this is, looks like an AK bolt on steroids. It's much larger. But as you can see, we have one, two, three locking surfaces instead of the two of the standard AK. So now what we're going to do is we're going to remove the optic. Now, pretty much all AKs use the same kind of a mounting system where you have a side-mounted uh, scope mount. We're going to pull that off. We're going to slide the optic right off. So you can see your scope mount right here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to remove the front cap so we can get to the gas system. Push down, and we're going to slide forward, and we're going to remove the handguards, and this exposes the gas system. So we're going to pull the gas tube back, we're going to lift it out of the receiver, and we're going to remove the gas pin. Now we're going to remove the front portion of the gas block, push down on the lever to unscrew. And there we have it. This is as far as you disassemble this rifle, rifle carbine, whichever model that you have. Anything further than this you want to have done by an armor. Now, please keep in mind when you look at this rifle, uh, you do have a relatively lightweight barrel compared to a standard like M110 or any type of a Western type rifle. Uh, also, keep in mind this is the Tiger Hunter, which is designed for hunting, which means you have the Tiger, which is the carbine, and Hunter means you have a lighter barrel. It's a lighter rifle, more designed for that of a hunter rather than uh, is actually a sniper, somebody who's required uh, extreme long range. Now, for reassembly, we're going to have to get the gas tube first. I'm going to reassemble, reinsert like so. I'm going to screw that back in place. We have to push upward on the locking lever, very similar to that of the button uh, when, you, when you put a muzzle brake or muzzle device on an AK. So that locks in place. Now we're going to take our chrome plated uh, gas piston going to insert. We're going to take our operating rod and spring, insert from the front, push in all the way to, all the way to lock all the way into the rear. And then we have our locking system, our, our operating system. So now we're going to re replace the handguards. Place. This is spring loaded, so it can be a little bit hard. So now we're going to take our bolt carrier, reinsert the bolt, make sure it goes into the cam track, drop it just like you would any AK, goes forward. You will see that you have a much smoother bolt than you would out of a standard AK type rifle. Now we're going to install the feed tray cover. Now we have to make sure that we insert the recoil spring into the back of the bolt. We're going to push the cover into place. 
And once we have it locked into place, we're going to take the locking lever, bring it back up until you hear it click. Now we're going to slide the scope back on. Now we're going to lock it in place. One of the features that the Dragon Hub does have, uh, regardless of which model that the standard AKs do not have, is on its last shot, it locks open. So you don't dry fire this rifle, you will be able to hear it and you'll be able to feel uh, when you fire your last shot. Next thing I want to talk about a little bit is the optic. The optic on this rifle is the PSO-1M2. It's a 4x24 optic. Uh, it's made in Belarius. Now this lacks the IR detector of the earlier PSO-1. Uh, it does have a telescopic front sleeve. It does have its adjustments. Now when you look through this scope, it is certainly not what you would expect uh, out of a Western rifle. However, this was state-of-the-art for the Soviet Union uh, back when the rifle came out. Uh, it forwarded it, it forwarded it to... At 4 to 24 power, you know, it's a relatively short range scope. I think it'd be very difficult to hit something, you know, beyond, uh, you know, three, 400 yards with it. Uh, it does have, you know, proper reticles in there so you can adjust size and you can, uh, do some range determination. Uh, but, uh, really, for as far as the optics goes, it's not, uh, what you would call modern. Now, for those who, who are collectors, this is certainly the way to go. This would be, uh, the original type optic that the gun would have. Uh, the, uh, the optic is made from a magnesium alloy. It's illuminated by, has illuminated reticle, uh, one AA battery. Uh, the finish is a baked enamel type finish. Uh, the inside is sealed with nitrogen to, uh, prevent fogging. Uh, the turret is adjustable to 1.72 MOA. Uh, there's no focus adjustment or parallax or, or, uh, compensation of control. Uh, the bullet drop compensator is one to a thousand meters. Again, I would really, uh, I would think I would have very big difficulty trying to see with this thing uh, at a thousand meters. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take us to the range and we're going to see how it shoots. Now, for as far as reliability, it's it's typical. It's typical what you expect out of the Soviets. Uh, it's as reliable as can be. A little bit more of a sharper recoil, obviously, than a standard AK because of the you know the very powerful cartridge. Now, my experience with these has been sort of minimal. Um, majority of my experience I've ever had with these was in the Ukraine with actual SVDs, and I can't say as I was too impressed with them back then. Uh, you know, I was I'm really used to more of the American type M110 SR25 type rifles as well as the LMT type rifles where I'm shooting sub MOA. So it's a whole different class of type firearms. Uh, the ammunition that we had out there at, in the Ukraine, it was the same ammunition we were firing in the PKM. In fact, um, when we were shooting the PKMs out there, we had belts that we were using the same ammunition out of the same box in the PKMs as well as the Dragunovs. So we certainly weren't using what you would call match-grade ammunition. So we get to look at the Dragunov for what it is. Uh, it's designed to be a DMR rifle, and it does fit that. It's been used in many different wars uh, throughout the world, uh, through different countries who manufactured it. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's been very effective, uh, with its penetration in the cartridge. Uh, it's gone through, goes through a lot of types of body armor. Um, the cartridge, even though it's from, from 1891, it is still viable today and it's still viable and seen in every battlefield in the world. So, uh, I really want to thank the viewer for love for loaning this to us. This was really nice, especially considering how expensive it was. And, uh, we're going to be doing one more video with this coming up. Uh, we're going to be doing a comparison between the SVD and the uh, Romanian PSL. Uh, so you can see the similarities. Many people think that the PSL is the Dragunov, and in reality, it's not. It's very, very different. So we're going to use this rifle one more time, and we're going to go through uh, the differences between the PSL and this one. I do hope you all enjoyed this video. If you do, please click like, please subscribe, and even better, share. Thank you.